Hello, I'm Dr. Jennifer Ridley, and I'm going to be going through your food sensitivity results with you. So you will need two documents during this video open in front of you. The first, your comprehensive food panel results, and that's what you see on the screen right here. So the way this test is done is the lab takes 184 individual wells and puts a different food in each well. Then your blood is put in on top of that and the computer watches to see which food your blood attacks. If your blood attacks that food, then it goes on this list in red. So your blood is attacking that food, creating inflammation in your system. So this is different than skin testing. So if you've had skin testing done before, you will notice you have different results. Skin testing for food is looking for immediate reaction food allergies. Those are the foods that would then trigger itching in your mouth or for your mouth or throat to swell and possibly even close. Those are much more serious allergies but most people have already figured out what foods trigger that kind of a response, so I find I rarely have to test for those. This is a test for delayed sensitivity food reactions. So when you ingest one of these foods, it might not create a reaction for you for up to 72 hours. So they're much harder to figure out, and that's why this test is so incredibly valuable. So these foods, when you ingest them right now, are creating inflammation. But what that inflammation then triggers inside of you can be different patient to patient and even different from food to food. So for example, I have a food sensitivity to yeast, which is what makes bread rise. So when I ingest food that contains yeast, I get a migraine headache. I also have a problem with tomatoes. But when I eat tomatoes, I get stomach upset. So different foods can trigger different reactions. And again, we all have different genetics and we all ended up where we are through a different series of events in our own lives. And we each have different Achilles heels. So what one food could trigger in you would be completely different in somebody else. For somebody else, it might trigger ADHD, memory, focus problems, insomnia, and for you, it might trigger migraines, depression, seizures, or asthma. So they're different patient to patient. So for now, we stop all of these foods. And later, when we add these foods back in in a very purposeful way, we'll figure out if they remain a problem for you and if they do, what reactions they trigger for you. So how did we all end up with food sensitivities or intolerances? It's very rare to be born with this many food problems. For most of us, they develop from a series of, of reasons. One, humans were intended to eat with the seasons. So if we were eating the way we were meant to be eating, you could never eat the same fruits and vegetables over and over and over. Limes would only be in season for a little while. Avocados only in season for a little while. And then for different proteins, we had different migration patterns. Different animals would be migrating through, so we would be eating different things year round. So eating the same things now over and over and over is part of our problem. Also, inefficient digestion. So it's different from patient to patient as to why that can develop, and we'll have to talk about that on an individual basis. But if you're not making as many enzymes as you used to be to help you digest your food or you're not making as much stomach acid as you used to be, that poor digestion causes partially digested proteins to get sent further down your digestive, digestive tract and that can cause problems for you. The body then starts to attack those foods. Also the condition known as leaky gut. So. If, you, if something is creating inflammation in your intestines, it's just like inflammation in ankle or wrist. It causes swelling. So when your intestines swell, they get leaky. So it's a lot like a leaky bucket. If you picture food as the water and your intestines as the bucket, 
If your intestines swell and you get these larger pores, now food starts to pour into your bloodstream in larger amounts than it's supposed to. And your body knows this is wrong, so it starts to attack those foods. So different things can create the inflammation that leads to leaky gut. Things like parasites, toxins, uh, food dyes and preservatives, parasites, and even different medications can cause this to happen. So however you ended up here, you're here now. So we need you to quit eating these foods for a season, for three months, to give your body a chance to heal and for these reactions to die down. Then you and I are going to go through a very purposeful way of reintroducing these foods and we'll end up with a much smaller list of foods that are going to be a long-term problem. But in order to get to that place where we can get meaningful data on the foods that are going to be a long-term problem, you have to give these foods up for three months. Now, an easier way to look at this is the other document, the foods you must avoid. So pull that one up next. What you're going to see here is the foods that you have an intolerance to have now been grouped into proteins, grains, vegetables, fruits, nuts, spices, beverages, and miscellaneous. And not only have they been grouped, but the laboratory has extrapolated data for you to keep you from making mistakes. So for example, this patient had a problem with gluten. So now the lab has added all of the different grains that contain gluten. Also, this patient had a problem with cow's milk. So now you'll see all the different cheeses have been added. So this is a better way to look at your data. So I suggest you work from this, from this sheet. Okay, so turn back to this document, your comprehensive food panel, and let's talk for a minute about these scores. So these scores represent the strength of your titer on the day that we drew your blood. So if there is a food on here that you had quit eating for a long period of time, either because you didn't like it or you suspected it was a problem, these titers would have died down and be much lower than what they actually might have been if you were eating that food regularly. So in the beginning, we treat all foods equally and we remove them all from our diet. And we'll come back at the, and look at these scores when we start reintroduction. All right, so this whole video has been a lot about what you can't have, but don't despair. The next video, I'm gonna talk more about the foods that you can still have. So the next video to turn on will be your food rotation video.